Warning. You've reached on the box with great comfort and are now in a biblical truth zone. Place all questions about theology, current events, and evangelism on the box where they'll be weighed against the truth of God's Word. Ready your hearts and minds. You're about to be inspired and equipped to fulfill the Great Commission. Programming to engage in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to On the Box with Ray Comfort. That's Hello. not Ray Comfort. That's <laughs> Mark's face. This is Ray Comfort. How that was you, a Ray? good start seeing Mark's face to yeah. begin with. It's kind of frightening. But hey, the show must go on. So if you could send us your videos, questions, and comments to on the box at livingwaters.com, we will comment on your comments. We might make a video about your video, but we will do something because that's what we do. Our blog is onthebox.us, and you could also find us on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, I watched The Way of the Master. Um, you did uh, last night. You I, I tear voted. In it, I as well. up, yeah, but it, it was just—it's been so long since. Uh, well, so long to get four yes. season onto TV, and it's been and so uh, going to 123 countries. I just I made myself watch it and just thought, what a wonderful thing this is, because I, I really want to see laborers raised up. And and yeah. uh, thanks to you pulling it together, uh, Eddie, uh, it looked really great. Oh. We're so close to it. It's in a yes. it's just a good to sit back sometimes and watch it objectively. I missed it. I should have watched. I'll watch it next week. I've got a TV. You could you know come okay. around house and watch it. I'll come on and watch it. <laughs> Mark, how are you doing over there today? Hmm? Great. I was on the chat room. They said that they showed one of our clips from uh, season four on uh, Wretched last night. Ooh. So that's what they were talking about. So I was jumping on in there. So it's neat. So we have uh, Todd Friel showing some of our material on Wretched, and then we debut on TBN. And I was told it was the most watched show ever. No, really? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. At that time it last night. It really wasn't. So we're just going to edit yeah. out the I'm kidding bit and use that. Yes. Yeah, that would be neat, wouldn't it? Why not? <laughs> Okay, we're going to check out some uh, email that some of you viewers out there sent us in. We have a wonderful email today. That's what the title of it says. Wonderful e email. This will be wonderful. Yeah, this is a time. Facebook message from Karen. It says, this is my 11-year-old daughter. Cue photo. <laughs> this is my 11-year-old daughter who was one day away from being aborted when wow. I was 11 weeks pregnant. I was told by the birth father that he had took meds, medication that would be, that would cause a child to be born with birth defects. So I went to Planned Parenthood for my initial consultation. Because of the laws in Tennessee, they were required to give me alternatives as well as a 48 hour, a 48 hour waiting period. Thank God for Hope Rescue Agency. They had their office right next door. I went directly to them. The counselor prayed with me and gave me hope. I had courage to stand up to the father and say no to the abortion. He was lying about the birth defects. Melody is now a beautiful, bright young lady who has a passion for Christ. She's familiar with Way of the Master, and she is sharing Christ in her mid middle school. So here is a young lady who is using Way of the Master stuff, and she almost was aborted. Wow. I wonder if she's giving away uh, 180 videos, 180 materials. I hope so. She should. Melody, contact us. We'll give you some free 180 Business cards on Ray. How's yeah, that? that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it. Okay? Yeah, we would. And no people faking that they're Melody, okay? Because uh -huh. there's only one Melody. I knew you were going to make a Melody joke. Yes. No. Just, <laughs> that wouldn't go there. The kids probably had that all their life. I didn't say, I didn't make a joke. I know, but I was just saying don't do it because okay. we don't want to draw I attention. But that's to great, Melody. Th thank you for uh, <laughs> what you're doing. And um, boy, it's, a, it's an awesome, awesome um, example of someone who's uh, living for Christ. All right, next we go to the Evidence Bible. Okay? We do? Yes, we do. The Daily Evidence Bible segment. We have a quote here from Bob Glenn. Would you like to read that or would I like to read that? You read it. Okay. <laughs> this is from the Evidence Bible. The Evidence Bible has lots of uh, quotes, such as this one. It says, Hell, speaking of hell, it says, Hell is a reflection of the holiness of God. Hell is as bad as God is good. The severity of hell shows you how good God must be. Because if the punishment for sinning against him is that severe, he must be awfully good. Yeah, I don't think there's anything as offensive as the doctrine of hell. If anything mm -hmm. I would like to be, uh, I'd like to get rid of in Christianity, it would be hell, but it wouldn't be Christianity, and it wouldn't be yeah. a reality. But hell does exist, whether we like it or not. You know, Eddie and Mark over in the other studio. Um, my relatives were over yesterday, as yes. some people know, because we had them on, my sister and her husband. We went to the mall. 
And I was walking through the mall. It was just a typical time at the mall. I haven't been in the mall for a while. And we're at the checkout stand, and there's a 15-year-old kid standing at the stand. And uh, there's a lady with him, his mother, and she's buying him a CD. And he just looked typical for today's generation and trying to find life and what he, what he really believes, what he is, his identity. Mm -hmm. And he had an effeminate head hairstyle, that sort of weird feminine look, and earrings, and she was buying him some music. And then we went walking through the mall and uh, saw a young guy walking through wearing a T-shirt with two girls kissing on the front and then on the lips. And then we went outside and there's rap music playing, you know, in some car really loud using the F-bomb, bomb, bomb, bomb. And it was just a typical day at the mall. And I'm sure when I was a teenager some years ago that some adult looked at me with my hair on my shoulders and weird clothes and thought, boy, you know, this generation has got to the pack morally what's happening. But something different is happening. We're seeing Romans chapter 1 where uh, people are giving themselves to things that are an abomination to the Lord. And God's mm -hmm. giving them over to a reprobate mind. Uh, and there's only one hope for this nation. That's why I'm so excited about four seasons. I'm more excited about four seasons than I television program it was about the first second and third for this reason what we do is we emphasize the importance and the biblical nature of open-air preaching yeah. and there's 70 million professing Christians in the US imagine if just one in 70 cared enough to preach open-air whether it be male or female wherever there are people because this generation is not going to come to church they hate us and that's biblical yeah. They love the darkness, hate the light, neither will they come to the light. They're not going to come to church. We have to go to them if we care about them, if we love them, because Absolutely. there is a very real place called hell. God hasn't changed these things from abomination to them. We may change, we may move with society and say, yeah, that's, that's just normal for today's youth. But God's anger is upon this generation because of its multiple sins and, and, and committing themselves into things that are an absolute abomination to them. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, you got any thoughts on... Yeah, you know, I, I remember hearing a story once uh, that Ray shares inside of his books that if you were to open up the newspaper and you were to see that somebody received a $10 fine without knowing what the crime was, you can safely conclude that whatever it is that he did, it wasn't very extreme. However, you turn it a few pages later and you were to see that somebody received seven multiple life sentences. Even though you don't know what the crime was, you can safely conclude that the crime that was committed was very heinous. Well, if you look at God, we know that all of our crimes against him are heinous. And how do we know that? It's because of the punishment that is going to be involved with every man, woman, and child that goes to hell. If you're in hell and you know that and you find out that your punishment is forever you can safely conclude that it really wasn't a white lie, a half-truth, an exaggeration, or a fib. You see, anything other than the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, is very heinous in the eyes of God. And this is even so with the big crimes, like rape and kidnapping and murder. Why are those big crimes to us? Because we would hate to have those things happen to us. Maybe those are things that we wouldn't do to other people. But God looks at little crimes as being big as well. And we're going to talk about today, if we have time, uh, the possibility of, e of even different degrees of hell when you get there. Different degrees of punishment given to people when they are there at the great white throne judgment. So we need to be careful to say, hey, it was just a small crime. Or it was just a little sin that I committed. See, anything small is actually big in the eyes of God. And the eyes of God are in every place, keeping watch of the good as well as the evil. And things that you may even think are good are actually heinous in the eyes of God if you're an unbeliever. You see, even your good deeds are filthy rags in God's sight. So we need to be careful in what we compare our sins to and who we compare them with. Because God is in control and he sees it all. He sees every bit. You know, one argument against hell, Mark, is uh, people say, oh, God's going to send the little sweet old lady to hell with that old fiddler. That makes no sense. No, the Bible says God's judgment are according to righteousness and there are degrees of punishment just as in a court of law. Uh, a good judge doesn't send a, a heinous criminal uh, into prison with someone who's committed a crime that's not so serious, but they will get exactly what they deserve. And that's what God promises, that the little old lady who was once a young, attractive girl and got into things that she knew that she shouldn't, and all that lifetime she stored up a multitude of sins, is going to get exactly what is coming to her. And the heinous criminal, Adolf Hitler, uh, a mass murderer of millions, he will get exactly what's coming to him. Mm. And the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And to say uh, there's no justice from God is idolatry. And to say there's no God is stupidity. So uh, those atheists that are watching, 
Man, come to your senses. Look around you at the genius of God's creative hand. Listen to the voice of your conscience. Look at those commandments and see that God offers you everlasting life. We don't believe hell exists. We know it exists. We've got the highest authority on the face of this earth. And not only that, that's the word of God. Not only that, but God who says these things manifest himself to us as Christians. It's happened to millions of people around the world where they come to know God. They don't see visions. I don't hear voices, but God transforms them on the inside, and it's as real as being born the first time when you're born the second time when you're born again, which you have to be if you want to escape hell and into heaven. Yeah, you know, you bring up a uh, good point there, Ray. You know, in that the objection goes something like this from the skeptic. You know, God is unfair in that Hitler and my little old grandma is both are both going to go to hell for the crimes that they've committed. Wait, let's look at what Hitler did. You know, he killed six million blacks, Jews, Christians, and gypsies. And my little grandma, she walked across the street when it said, don't walk. I mean, how do you compare the two? You can't put the two together and both are going to go to hell. Well, first of all, what I'd like to point out is that they're saying that God is unfair. What is your standard of fairness? Where do you, as the non-believer in God's holy writ, get to determine what is fair and what is not fair? Well, welcome to a world that is not fair, first of all, before I answer that question, because life is not fair. I love it when my kids come to me and they say, hey, it's not fair. Noah got this or Ethan got that. I say, guys, listen, the world is not fair. If your next door neighbor has 14 vehicles in his driveway and you have zero, your neighbor is under no obligation to give you a vehicle. That's the world in which we live in. It's the folly of fairness. Michael Pearl wrote a great article on the folly of fairness where he addresses that issue. And we need to teach our kids right from the beginning that life is not fair. Well, since life is not fair, why would we think anything else is fair or unfair? Where do you get this idea of fairness? You see, I don't think it was fair for God to reach into the dark cavern of my heart and do the one thing for me that I couldn't do for myself, and that is make me right with him. The moment I repented of my sins and placed my trust in the only one who paid the ultimate price, I was given a free gift, and that free gift is given to you. That's not fair. That's not fair that God Almighty would stoop down to your level, look you into the eye, and say, hey, man, I'm going to offer you the same thing. Are you willing to confess your sins? Are you willing to forsake them? Hey, if you're willing to humble yourself under my mighty hand, I'm going to lift you up. See, you can either humble yourself or you can allow God to humble you. You don't want God to humble you. You humble yourself because there's going to come a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and it's going to bring glory to God. You know, I, <laughs> the other day Ray came into the studio Right, and you said, yeah, I, I got into a debate with uh, um, some atheist. What was his name? Uh, Aaron, Aaron, I'm all, Aaron Raw? I mean, that, that guy's huge on YouTube. And Ray had no idea who this guy was, and I, I just started listening to this debate, and it's funny how undoubtedly you have a lot of these atheists that look into Ray's life, and they're trying to trip him up. They want to get at him. You know, Ray is affectionately known as the banana man. Right, And I'm not so sure that the whole banana scenario even fits, but I was talking with Daniel earlier today, and Daniel said, all right, let me get this straight. Scientists can continually change their mind because science is evolving. The moment Ray begins to admit a wrong, and he's not even convinced that he is wrong. I'm not convinced that he is wrong in the whole banana idea. But the moment he says that he's wrong, you've got to throw everything out. Everything that he ever stood for, everything dealing with Christianity. Well, that's a little inconsistent, isn't it? Why is it that science gets to continually change? We grab a hold of a transitional fossil, for example, and say, oh, that's no longer a transitional fossil. Let's get rid of that idea. And then we just gloss over it until the next so-called trans transitional fossil comes forward and it's able to link ape to man. Well, why isn't science and scientists and atheists held to the same standard by which they want to hold Christians in Ray Comfort to? I mean, it's absolutely silly. If you were to look at Ray's life, he's a man that wants to look into your life and say, hey, man, I'm not better than you, but I might be better off. In the same way a man, two men, jumping out of a plane, one has a parachute on and one doesn't. One is not better than the other, but he certainly is better off, isn't he? Well, Ray would be willing if, hey, if you want to sit down and talk, he'd be willing to sit down and talk. He buys lunches and dinners uh, for atheists all the time. He loves atheists. In fact, this show has evolved to the place to where he wants to reach out to you, wants to, willing to give you the time of day. Let's see, the skeptics offer the same thing. It, it, it tends to not happen. You know, Richard Dawkins thinks that Ray wants to get his 15 minutes of fame by debating him. He doesn't want to stoop down to his level. Oh, please, like Ray really needs the publicity. 
You know, there's so many arguments that Ray can give out when he's inside of a debate or that we can give. What does he focus in on? The gospel. Why? Because he cares about you. That's why. There's so many different arguments that we can bring out, but given a short amount of time, not only does he address those things, but he wants to address upon the thing that is the most important, and that is your soul, your heart before God, because you don't want to die in the place that you're in. There you go. You well know, put, Mr. Spence. You know, Ray, I'm not an atheist, but would you buy me lunch? <laughs> <laughs> there's no such thing as a free lunch, so oh. I say. Actually, read your Bible if you think there's no such thing as a free lunch. Jesus fed 5,000 people free of charge. Fish wow. sandwiches. It was great. That wasn't in the script. That was good. Oh, no, it's just There's no pop. script, actually. There's no applause today because there's no audience. You know, we don't want anyone to, to go to hell, obviously. And, and uh, one of the things we do here, here at Living Waters is we produce gospel tracks. Okay, you go to livingwaters.com, check out the tracks, and we are going to look at... One of the tracks we make right now, the Curved Illusion track. So the goal of a lot of our, our tracks, you know, the track is, a tract is basically a piece of paper, a booklet that has the gospel message on it. And one of the things we try to do is just be very creative in, in the way um, we give them to people just so people take them. You know, you, you got the different million, trillion dollar bills and things like that. And one of the coolest tracks we have is the Curved Illusion. And Mark Spence is going to show us how to use the curved illusion right here, because he's a professional. All right. Um, boy, I'm actually really interested to get into a little online debate with God doesn't exist. Don't go anywhere. He I want to talk to He you. doesn't exist. You don't need so, to talk uh, to So hopefully him. you guys can handle the rest of the show, and I want to talk to that guy. But here it is. This is our gospel track. It's the curved illusion. Uh, which one looks longer, the red or the blue? You look at it and you go, obviously the blue looks longer. Now which one is it? It's the red. They're actually the same size. It's an optical illusion. Our eyes play tricks on us and even so not just our eyes but our heart does our mind is easily deceived so we need a truth outside of ourselves and so this is a gospel track and this is um, a really neat gospel track because it's, it's I think this is a uh, easy's favorite track he approaches uh, teenagers out on um, the strip where we go witnessing and people they eat it up so they're real easy to hand out if you want to get a hold of these go to livingwaters.com where we have tons of other gospel tracks hey, and Mark, you don't want to miss it yes we should put them out as a black and a yellow banana curved illusion a track. Yellow curved banana. <laughs> no, uh, that would be neat that would uh, be awesome yeah, see how people feel about that yes that'd be very appealing okay okay so we're going to move on to our what hollywood believes segment here okay we got a uh website hollywoodandgod.com and Ray wrote a book a while back. And what was the name of that book? Uh, what Hollywood Believes and it was about what Hollywood believes. Yes, mm. okay. So we're going to look at uh, one of the many actors in it. Today we're going to take a look at George Clooney. Heard of him? Yes, Mrs. Clooney's little boy. Yes, okay. So George Clooney, he described the ideal scenario for life. He said the way you want to do it is like Cary Grant. Have a successful career then decide you're looking too old, leave the movies, and never look back. <laughs> then at 80 years old, have a stroke and drop dead. It's perfect. Yeah, that's, that's a what great, he said. great, really thought, he thought that out well, didn't he? Yes, yeah, so that's what his... What about uh, Cary Grant thought of that? I wonder, I wonder if he wonder... didn't mind losing his looks and losing everything that comes with youth, including mm. your uh, pleasures of the marital bed and all the other things. Everything just goes to the pack. Hair falls out, eyes go, taste buds go, brain goes, you lose brain cells. Who are you? You grow a beard. Yeah, grow a beard. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a stroke and you drop dead. Very <laughs> nice. That's a great, great purpose. Well, even, joy and a even besides that, I wonder what Cary Grant <coughs> thinks about it now. I know yeah. exactly what Cary Grant would be saying right now if he could be here. He'd say, don't miss heaven, hmm. wherever he is. So, another thing, uh, Clooney, Clooney Grant, George George Clooney said, he said, when I was 16 years old, a friend and I decided that after we no, turned... No, that was me that said this. Oh, well, Mark, and I this? Were discussing <laughs> this. Mark and I were discussing this up here, and we were kind of prepared so we knew what it says, but you fell in the trap, so it's a bit of a sad... I've yeah, been it's actually me that said that. I had a friend when I was young, it's true. Mm -hmm. His name was Rod, and uh, we used to surf together, and we decided at the age of 16 uh, that when you turn 50, life was no longer worth div div uh, living, so you just commit suicide. And he said, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to commit suicide at 50. And he did. He did. He, he really did. didn't. He did. I don't know if uh, he did it with joyful, uh, with joyfulness, but he, he got into drugs, ended up in prison, became a homosexual, lived a life of guilt, and killed himself just at the age of 50. So I thought it was such an irony. And none of us wants to uh, grow old, lose our looks, and all the things that come with youth, and have a stroke at the age of 80. Not only that, millions of people have died in their teenage years. Uh, millions of people have died in war right at the prime of life. 
There were 50, 50 million people died in the Second World War alone. And many of them were young men who were out fighting for a, a cause they probably didn't even really know what was going on. They were just told to in script. And, and they're out and get shot to pieces and, and, and lost their precious lives. Mm -hmm. And yet we, we're here now alive and with, uh, by the grace of God we can secure our eternal salvation. So please realize how precious uh, your life is to you um, and, and how God doesn't want you to lose it. So, Mark, I understand that uh, you have a, a story about Clooney here and a, a gospel track involving a gospel track? Yeah, you know, I, uh, with uh, Kirk and Easy and uh, Brad and my pastor, Philip DeCourcy, we went out to eat. We were going to a debate. And as uh, before the debate, we went out to dinner. And as we were coming out of the dinner uh, place, there was a cafeteria over there in Hollywood. We saw a red carpet and people were uh, snapping pictures and stuff. And I go, hey, I recognize the scene. Hey, let's jump on over there. And I saw, didn't even know this was going on. It was just steps away from where we were eating dinner. And George Clooney, I go, hey, there's George Clooney. Uh, so I jumped up to the front. You can kind of see my head. It's in front of his. Oh, yeah. It's the tall one. And uh, nice I go, hey, I want to get him a gospel track. Mm -hmm. So I uh, leaned forward. I held out the million dollar bill. He took it. And he went to sign it, he signed it, and then I was able to give him one, and he held up the million dollar bill, and he goes, hey, look, I'm rich. I'm finally a millionaire, is what he said. And he held the, uh, the million dollar bill up for the camera, and everybody kind of took pictures for it. But it was kind of neat, he was very jovial, he was excited. There's his long signature, uh, G. C, I guess oh, is what it looks like. It looks G, like GG. Nice. It looks like GG, doesn't it? Uh, GG. Yeah, that's George Clooney's signature right there. So that's really my uh, testimony. But he, you know, he did say something very interesting. It's something that I share. You know, he once said, I don't believe in heaven and hell. Um, I, in fact, I wrote it down here. Um, it's six. That's, oh, we actually have it down. <laughs> Statement <laughs> six. Statement yeah. six. Okay, he said, uh, I don't believe in heaven and hell. I don't know if I believe in God. All I know is that as an individual, I won't allow this life, the only thing I know to exist, to be wasted. And I've pondered on that quite a bit. And I think, how does a man who doesn't believe in the afterlife live his life any way he wants? When he's not accountable, he can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, to whomever he wants, and he feels he could answer to no one. It's called man's sovereignty. It's a lot similar to God's sovereignty, but whatever God does is just and right and true unlike man. So I wonder how George lives his life. I pray that he does come to the truth, reads the back of that gospel track, and comes to his senses. You know, I, I'm amazed, Mark, how many people think that reality changes because they don't believe in it. I don't believe in hell, therefore hell doesn't exist, and I'll live the life I want. Mm -hmm. um, but if I don't believe in the sun, you know, I, or I believe wrongly that it's square and it comes out at night and it's made of ice, it doesn't change realities. So what we believe or don't believe doesn't change a thing. And hell exists whether we believe in it or not. The other thing is George Clooney says he didn't want to waste his life. The inference was if I become a Christian or, or become, quote, religious, then it's a waste of life. But Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? If you ignore God's mercy, you are wasting this precious life. It's, it could be eternal, and you're, getting a, you're just chopping it off and going to end up in hell. And maybe you say, I don't believe in the soul. You know, I had a great time with an evolutionary biologist in uh, UCLA. I went yes. and interviewed him. And uh, he changed his mind about the existence of the soul in about 30 seconds. Uh, he said, as we were talking about the stupidity of evolution, he said, I don't believe in the soul. And I said, do you know the Bible uses the word soul and the word life synonymously? They're ex interchangeable. He says, well, I believe in the soul then. So Jesus said... when. What should the prophet of man if he gains the whole world and loses his own life? You are a soul. That's what is in our bodies. I, I'm the same soul I was at the age of four years old. I've got a different looking body. I didn't have a beard and wasn't so good looking when I was four. But my soul is the same. I've just gained knowledge and experience. And so your soul is the real you that's talking out of this thing we call the body, this machine that's called the body. And you don't want to lose that life. It's so precious. Yeah. The soul is... is uh What's going to live forever, ever, whether you believe it or not, you know, whatever, whatever your view is. And, and going back to, you know, the, the argument before, is God, is God fair? Well, when a person asks that question, they're basically saying, you know, I'm God. I'm the one who gets to say what's fair, what's not fair, what's right and wrong. And, you know, that's, that's basically the, the story of the Bible is a story of idolatry and, and just human beings making idols before God whether it's a false god, whether it's themselves, whatever it is, people just don't want to believe in the God of the Bible, you know? And, and um, 
one of the one of the questions you know that we we get from time to time concerning this this god that people are pretending doesn't exist pretending they don't have to to face one of the questions we get is how can people be happy in heaven knowing that their unsaved loved ones are suffering in hell okay so that's that's the that's the you know supposed ob- objection that comes up if i'm going to heaven i'm supposed to be happy all the time but how can i be happy if i know that you know some of my loved ones aren't going to be there you know how do you answer that one Ray? you know it comes back to idolatry once again it it, it it shows that our concept of god is totally erroneous mm. we've got god in a box he can't do things but you think imagine if you were around before creation came into being and you thought okay i wonder what this is going to be like when god says let there be light Mm-hmm. And God speaks and creation comes into existence and we have flowers and birds and trees and the moon and the stars. The, we have uh, the seasons and all the fruits including bananas and apples and oranges and grapes and pears and all these things and the marvels of the human body and the joys of uh, the marital bed. Why am I talking about that again <laughs> That's today? the second time you yeah, said it in the second show. Time I said day. But there were so <laughs> many things that God has created that we couldn't have begun to conceive uh, that would take place. And what are you laughing about, Alan? Yeah, so um, so obviously God can handle all the stuff that we can't figure out. Uh, and so it comes back to our understanding of uh, God's ability and, uh, and what he's going to do for those that love him. So Mark, you got anything to add to that nope. statement? Nothing? No, that's good. Great. Right. Okay. Well, tomorrow we're going to be talking, about, we're going to be answering the question, are Mormons Christian? That's a question that's in the news a lot with the uh, Presidential well, we dealt with it the other week, but we, there was so much more to come, so we decided we would tomorrow. see what evolves. So, tomorrow uh, is the second Please join time. us tomorrow, because it's something that's kind of more, more relevant as this uh, political fight goes on because yes. of uh, uh, the candidate being uh, Mormon. Okay, so until next time, send us your questions, videos, everything else you got, bouquet of flowers, a uh, bunch of bananas, too, on chocolate. the box at livingwaters.com. All right, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. For questions about On The Box with Ray Comfort or to submit questions for future shows, please email onthebox at livingwaters.com. That's onthebox at livingwaters.com. On The Box with Ray Comfort is an outreach of Living Waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, check out livingwaters.com or call toll-free 1-800-437-1893. Now go and preach the gospel. What?